welcome to this, another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and today we've got bonus lens month. Uh, you know, we, we actually recorded lens month a few months ago, uh, and then as they came out, I was uh, delighted to hear that the folks at Atlas Lens Co. Uh, wanted to talk to me. So um, we've got Dan Keynes and Daniel Lewis, the CEO and production coordinator over at Atlas, and we had a fantastic fun discussion um, talking about anamorphic lensing, you know, um, Dan, CEO Dan, um, uh, is is a prolific cinematographer and and camera department guy as well, so we got to talk about his up, um, coming up in the industry. Uh, He actually used to work with Eric Measureschmidt, we talk about that, Um, we talk about, you know, being skate guys and, uh, you know, kind of starting in skate films and, and our influences there, you know, was, we were, were cut from the same cloth, which is really fun. And, um, you know, get to talk about the uh, lenses that Atlas makes and, and sort of that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, Dan actually also founded Paralynx, um, if you have ever used those products. Um, so just a really awesome, uh, in my head, bonus talk. Um, not that I wouldn't talk to him not outside of Lens Month, but, you know, it all fit the program and all that. Um, so without any ados being furthered, here's my talk with Dan and Dan of Atlas Lens Co. So the, the way I like to start is uh, kind of asking everyone the same question, which is, uh, how did you get started? So Dan, I know you are a cinematographer. You worked in the industry for some time. Oh, we've got two Dans. That's going to be weird. Okay. Uh, but uh, tell me how you kind of, you got your story. DJ. He goes by DJ. All right, cool. Uh, uh, but yeah, how did you get started in the industry? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so my name is Dan Keynes. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Atlas Lens Co. And the way I got started in cinematography is the way a lot of people do as a production assistant. Um, I knew that someday I wanted to become a cinematographer and I wasn't quite sure what route I might be able to take to get there. So the way that many of us start is um, just being a gopher, doing whatever is needed on set, running around like a chicken with our heads cut off and uh, charging walkie-talkie batteries and picking up expendables from Expendables Recycler if you're here in LA, uh, working on low-budget jobs. Um, and quickly, I realized that the production assistant life is not for me. I, I wanted to learn from cinematographers and be closer to the camera action on set and uh, I saw the way that the lighting crews would work. I thought, wow, that's for me. Like lighting has always been an inspiration. Um, it's why I decided to become a cinematographer, just being inspired by the way light falls in nature. And, um, you know, I think the earliest kind of things that told me I want to make movies were skateboard movies with my friends. So we'd watch uh, a lot of the girl films, skate yeah. movies. Yeah, right. Uh, by Spike Jones and, and his team. And um, someone's, uh, you know, gesturing at us through the window here. We're in a, we're a little fit here in the front of the office, and I don't think they know we're in a podcast. But, um, That's fine. yeah, so we'd make little skate movies with my friends, and um, I inherited a hand-me-down Minolta uh, X1000 camera from my parents. And, um, you know, this is in the days before digital photography took off. So... I scrounge change to get rolls of film and go photograph my friends and, uh, you know, get them developed at Costco and stuff like that. And then we were fortunate enough to have a uh, darkroom photography class in my junior high school, um, which I mean, what a treat, like, yeah, I don't even do that in high school anymore. No, I mean, I really fell in love with the way that we could do things in the darkroom to manipulate the image by dodging and burning and it's just such a tactile experience. And um, I fell in love with f- the photographic medium there and knew that this is something that was going to be part of my life uh, for the rest of my life. Yeah. When you, the, I, I had a nearly similar uh, start with the skate films and like Spike Jones, just Spike Jones simultaneously doing skate films, Jackass, and Oscar nominees all at the same time for me was very like uh, empowering, so to speak. Yeah, and those early music videos uh, from him, oh, like yeah. that first Weezer video, um, like when Weezer was good. And, <laughs> uh, 
so many good videos. It's like the BC boy sabotage video, which is still to this day, like insane and just such a banger. I showed that to my kids. My daughter's four and my son is uh, 19 months old. And like, just to see their reaction to something like that was really cute and funny. That song too is like a legit adrenaline shot in, in music. Like there, there's no way you can't be like, ah, you know, <laughs> uh, I actually just picked up the, uh, uh, Spike Jones, Michelle Gondry, uh, Chris Cunningham DVD box set. Ooh. Like that was, or you know, I picked that up maybe like two, three months ago. But I remember when I was getting into film school, some guys that were ahead of me were like, this was our Bible. And I couldn't find it for years. And then I found some library had it and they sold it to me for like 40 bucks. This must be in the zeitgeist right now, because I was just reflecting about that trilogy of DVDs and some of the other, you know, I don't know if you've seen the Aphex Twin window liquor video. Oh yeah. That was huge back in the day. That's another piece of like early discovery of anamorphic cinematography for me and going like, why does this look like this? And it's just so bonkers. I love it. Yeah. That was, what was that? Window liquor was like 2006, maybe. Oh, way, way before that. I feel like it was. Is that 03? I feel like it was 2001. I could be wrong about that. I, it could be. I just remember, maybe I just found it later because of the internet. But I remember that video. I, I remember thinking like, why does this look, same thing. Like, why does this look like a movie? And why is it the most unsettling thing <laughs> I've ever seen? What about you, uh, uh, DJ? You you cinematographer at all? Or are you more in the like science kind of realm? I'm more in the science. I actually kind of got started here as a sort of like complete random like uh, event it was sort of like things just colliding me looking for somewhere to work at the same place they were hiring and I didn't think it would be a good fit at, at first because I think when I started I probably couldn't tell you the difference between a lens and a camera and it just sure I, I have a good general understanding of, of math and science so I was able to learn pretty quickly and it's so weird to me now kind of looking back I'll look back at my old like Instagram photos that I edited and I'll just look at them with like such disdain because I'm, I'm, I'm learning all these the lighting, contrast, spacing, all these different things where I realized looking back, you know, it's sort of like uh, an artist looking back at like uh, their old, you know, drawings when they were three. It just looks so much different now. I mean, that's the move, isn't it? Like baby. Say again? I came in as a complete baby about three years ago. That's legit though. But I, I will say you don't have to be too hard on yourself. Cause I think all of us, like when you start, you, you edit the hell out of it to make up for the fact that you have terrible technique. And then at a certain point you've got great technique and it doesn't really need any editing, you know? Exactly. <laughs> so you can see your own progress. Over um, perfect description. <laughs> yeah. Did, uh, coming up in the film industry, I saw one, one of the probably, um, bigger gigs that seemed you work on uh dan was uh the number 23 which i actually liked i know it got panned but i enjoyed it when it came out um working on bigger sets and stuff like that did you have any sort of uh mentors or anyone helping you out as you came up as a cinematographer absolutely i mean i would say um reflecting on that exact film and those times in my life i was working as a set lighting technician as a third electrician for Eric Messerschmitt. So at that time, Eric oh, wow. was the gaffer. And so I worked with him on TV shows like Everybody Hates Chris. Uh, I worked with him on Bones a little bit. And, you know, I was sort of like kind of the baby of his crew. And he wasn't that much older in years than me, but the way that he carried himself, I always knew this guy is going somewhere and I should be watching just his approach, not only to lighting, but his approach to politics and to um, set etiquette. So, you know, that's a big thing coming from being a PA and then getting into set lighting. You know, as a PA, you can kind of observe set etiquette and pick up a few things. Um, And then once you get into more serious roles, even if it's just a third electrician where you're running cable and setting lights, a sort of etiquette and procedure gets kind of burned in your brain just by necessity in order to make your day. And we were working crazy hours on those TV shows. Like everybody hates Chris. It's a comic comedy show, but we were working like 16 hour days. So um, it's kind of a pirate's life. And 
it was great because it really taught me determination and chutzpah, as they say. Um, just have guts, you know, you have to really fight for what you believe in if you know that it's right. Um, but there's also a, a kind of calmness you have to find in sitting in the pocket, watching, observing, listening, and then anticipating the needs before. If you can anticipate needs on a film set or um, in film production in general, you'll go very far because it's just about kind of a Zen art. You you've kind of find your flow you see and listen and observe. And, and that's one of the things that's been really inspirational to me. So going back to the mentors, I'd say uh, Eric Messerschmidt when he was a gaffer and then seeing his recent success as an outstanding world-class cinematographer has been um, very meaningful and, and heartfelt for me. Um, Francis Kenny ASC, he's a mentor to me. He's a, he's a hero. Um, a lot of the ASC members, the older ASC members, and even the people who run the ASC, like, Alex and Patty, um, they're an inspiration to me because they, you know, they're not only there for the parties, but they're there for the build up and the tear down of the parties that happen and, you know, making sure that the members know when the parties are and making sure that things are set up. Um, so I've been really fortunate to, you know, make friends with those people. I volunteered at the ASC um, as a digital imaging technician, oddly enough, mm -hmm. for their master classes for a couple of years. Um, so I learned a lot there. Uh, just listening and, and observing and talking with members. Um, so that's been a really, you know, amazing treasure to me. Uh, people like Christopher Choman, ASC, huge inspiration. Um, a lot of really great people. David Darby. Yeah. The uh, Earlier when you were talking about the politics, is there, um, did you ever figure out a way to kind of uh, fight for an idea that you know is going to be received better uh without treading on too many toes versus uh, acquiescing and letting um let's let's just say it's a producer but whoever client maybe um who's like no trust me do this and then you do it and they're dissatisfied with the and i'm asking this because it just happened to me <laughs> where it's i was like great. i knew it <laughs> it's a great question i mean this this has definitely been um that's a challenge I faced as a cinematographer many times in lighting um, and in cinematography, it's really all about showing people. So, you know, the biggest inspiration that's come to me as a manufacturer of lenses from being on set is in film, we're rapid prototyping every day, every shot. So really at the end of the day, prototyping is just about showing people how you see reality and it's filtering it. Right. So, if you let someone feel that the idea is theirs and it came from them, they will own that idea more than you ever could convince them. And so if you're able to, to subtly show someone an idea and let that kind of become part of their mindset and then let them tell you what they saw that you showed them, that is so rewarding for them. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, sometimes it's just about um, knowing that balance, like, Recently, I did a shoot with Cardi B. So I still do filming from time to time when it doesn't interfere with my work here at Atlas. And I had a, a Cardi B and Facebook job. And everybody was predicting, okay, Cardi B is going to be late. And she's only going to want to give us five minutes of our time, of her time. She was the utmost professional. So she gave us all the time we needed. The one thing that she did do was make me move the camera. And I'm not going to tell Cardi B no, I have to be exactly three and a half feet from you because we're trying to simulate a cinematic Zoom phone call. And that's how the lens should be. If Cardi B tells me I need to be five feet back to make her look good the way that she knows she looks good, I'll do that and I'll just put a longer lens on if that's what she wants and we'll make it work. You're going to say, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you got to go with the flow, but um, you know, if you show someone something, so it wasn't about her telling me it has to be six feet back. It was just, you know, we just have to give her that comfort level and that confidence. So that's, it's a give and take. It's all about giving people the confidence to be a participant in working with you in one way or another. And when we have to work quickly in rapid prototyping a shot or rapid prototyping a product, um, it's all about that collaborative effort and just listening. And even if you know something's better, it's, Sometimes you have to show someone. So 
the way you can most tangibly present that in a gentle way, um, I find often works the best for me. Yeah. Now that you're, um, kind of, I don't know how, how much contact you had with the ASC, uh, during your, the bulkier shooting days, but now I know, uh, with the lenses, they, they're, you're definitely around them a lot more. Um, what are you learning from those guys being in those rooms? Um, both as a, as a part of the sort of, um, mechanical part of filmmaking, but also as an artist. I think the biggest thing I'm learning from ASC members is trying to approach things with grace, right? So approaching things with graceful calm and confidence, but also knowing that whatever we're presenting may not be right, but it may be right in the moment. And to be able to be able to just listen to people and also share your ideas is just it gives me so much joy. And I think that's, that's the key. And that's the, that's the thing I'm learning from the ASC members is at the end of the day, even if you're Roger Deakins, um, you're still the cinematographer, you're not the director. So if the director wants something and the producers want something, how do you meet in a way that makes sense for them and for, for you, you know, to represent their vision. I mean, they're trusting you enough to represent their vision. And I think the higher level you get in your cinematography career, the more people will not even question you. So you kind of have some opportunities there um, as an artist rather than as a cog in a wheel, so to speak. You know, we, we're, we're all helping make sure that this machine turns over. So we're all gears in a way, but how do we be okay with that? And then the higher you get, eventually you're an artist. So they're, they're not even gonna question choices that you make at some level, but at the same point, you're only as good as your last film. So you still have to make the right choices in one way or the other, but, and then you have to make the accidents look like they're on purpose, right? Yeah. Happy yeah. accidents, like happy little trees, like Bob Ross says. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Happy little trees. The, it, it's funny you say that you're, I think you're the, like the fourth or fifth person who said you're only as good as your last shot. And I, I feel like, or your last film, last shot, whatever it may be. And I feel like that, um, that mantra has sort of been lost recently. I don't know about, you know, it depends on the style of work you do, but I feel like a lot of people are like, you know, it seems like people are more comfortable phoning it in because, uh, the, the medium has been devalued, maybe not in terms of uh, film or television, but kind of the day-to-day commercial, uh, industrial, whatever gigs, it does feel a lot more like you put one light here, you put one light here, you turn it on, everything's going to work out great. I know how to color it. Um, go ahead. I'm starting to, sometimes you need to, sometimes people want to go eat McDonald's and then sometimes they want to try a different restaurant. And I, I don't think McDonald's is any worse for the fact that it's, consistent that's that's part of the the vibe there but you know i have i do have a funny quote for you that's it's not funny it's actually kind of touching it's um it's from maya angelou and she said um people will forget what you did they'll forget what you said but they'll always remember how you made them feel and that's what i try to imbue in the products here at atlas that's what i try to imbue in my relationships with our team here um, that's what I try to imbue in my cinematography is is feeling so that when you watch something I've filmed, even if it's something really prosaic and very cut and dry, that's still a little piece of me or a little slice of humor just slides in there and catches your catches your mind like a hook in a song and, and just gives you that little bit of satisfaction that you go, ah, that's a feeling. I got a vibe there. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I, I'm actually super happy you said that because that's been part two of my thought there, which I'm uh, one thing I've learned about doing this podcast is I'll articulate something and then in the edit, I'm like, oh, no, I knew what I meant. <laughs> but part two of that is uh, we seem to have forgotten feeling. Everything seems to be rote now. There are objective answers to choices. You know, oh, you should have used. I just did this whole diatribe about like the black pro mist. I interviewed Ellen Curris and she was like, I never used the promist once. It's too fuzzy. There's no sensibility to it. Um, and I was like, that's fascinating because if you go on YouTube, everyone says the promist is the only way to get the film look quote unquote. Um, 
and and it I think it does have to do come down to the two things that you said one feeling and two um, uh, uh, trusting yourself um, what do you call that when you believe in yourself <laughs> confidence Self-confidence. confidence thank you yeah yeah good lord it shows how much of that I have um, uh, I think those are crucial. And that feeling is like the, what makes things good. You know, what people, people, what did, uh, I quoted this before, but, um, uh, John Mayer was talking about fonts and he was like, don't give me a, a defont.com font on a mock-up because your heart doesn't know, or your head doesn't know, but your heart will. <laughs> I like that. I like it's like that. same thing with film, you know? Um, and it's kind of the same thing, like, uh, kind of, slick dovetail Kenny um right into uh the lenses that that is kind of the um the vibe that you guys were going for with the atlas lenses was more feeling based and not like what I think more um hi, not higher end but the bigger budget lens companies go is they're very clinical they're coming at it from like well we checked the charts and it looks great why don't you like it <laughs> That's a challenge that I think the biggest lens manufacturers in the world are facing is it's um, a philosophical battle, right? If the engineers and engineering says this lens is resolving the most MTF that we've ever resolved, the contrast is the highest it's ever been, and yet we feel nothing. You know, artists feel nothing or viewers feel nothing. They say, well, that's a perfect replication of reality. Um, that's not necessarily what people want, but that's the beauty of filters, right? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, to a degree, but certainly, uh, you know, the lens, uh, the, the more and more, especially after doing this whole lens month thing, uh, you know, it's, it's been interesting, especially playing with my own lenses and being able to really, ob- uh, not more objectively, but more, um, critically look at the various elements of the lenses that I do have and actually be able to educate with a sense of education um, address issues like these Nikkor primes. The fall off is really, really nice. Even though if I were to take a still photo, it looks all um, you know almost no different than this Tamron zoom I've got. But then in in motion and and in um, in the heat of the moment, I don't know what you want to call it. It is a much more pleasing to my feeling uh, look. Is that a Nikkor fifty? Thirty five. Thirty five. The one point four or the two? Two. Awesome. AI, AIS lens. Yep. Yeah. Those are great. Yeah. I've got a, I got a whole set. Cause back in the day, um, I bought my uncle's, um, F2 and his lens kit. Cause he was a photojournalist. Um, and he was retired. So I took all those off him. Awesome. And now I can use them on the, it didn't really quite make any sense on the, on my C100, but on the C500, it's like, they're perfect. It has Nikon color. I'm, I'm feeling like the Nikon color is coming through. It's well, and on this speci- on this camera, what I did was uh, this is going to get in the weeds a little bit, but um, I did I took uh, an Alexa and I shot color charts next to all of the Canon C series cameras because I had heard over and over that we use Canon as a B cam all the time to Alexa because it's easy to match. And I was like, well, let's make it easier. So I just in the color. Um, profiles in the cameras i took a vector scope and i just matched them as easily as i could to the alexa so that it was like a plug and play option so that's going on plus the the nikon lens and i fuck with the tint a little bit but um but so but enough about my haphazard not engineering uh where did the idea for the atlases start because i uh obviously we all love anamorphic like we like you're saying we kind of grew up on it you know the classic like Star Wars, Indiana Jones type thing, especially. Um, but what made you want to go into lensing specifically? Yeah, I mean, as you said, it really comes down to feeling. I first discovered anamorphic cinematography in around 2002, 2003, watching the movie Punch Drunk Love and going, okay, there's something about this movie and it reminds me of movies from my childhood, like you were talking about. And the way that they're using the flare and stuff to kind of convey Adam Sandler's emotional state and the things that are going on in the film. Wow, there's something about this. I got to understand this more. So I started doing research. What kind of lenses did they use? Um, Because everyone was shooting film back then. 
And I discovered, okay, these are Panavision C series and okay, anamorphic lenses. Like I want to make still images that look this good because at that time, you know, I didn't have access to a movie camera. I had friends that had uh, DVX 100 cameras and all I had was my, I still had my uh, Minolta stills camera. So I thought, how can I make some cinematic looking portraits of my friends that remind me of this movie? So I started doing some research and I found out, okay, anamorphic lenses, I wonder what's out there. And I found on eBay, you know, projector lenses. And I started trying to hack those projector lenses onto my Minolta camera. And, you know, sure enough, you can get an image doing that. There's still people doing DIY builds of anamorphic lenses that same way today. Mm -hmm. And I made a bunch of portraits of my friends and, you know, I'd bring them into Photoshop and then do the de-squeeze and uh, did like a little mini art show, those, those portraits and uh, kind of put it on the back burner. I was doing the set lighting um, with Eric Messerschmidt and Eric Forand in the gang and just left that in the back of my mind. And I, I looked at like other anamorphic lenses. So that was, that was a time when um, Lomo anamorphic lenses you could find on eBay or from someone like RAF camera um, in Ukraine or in, in different parts of Russia, they had anamorphic primes for $500. And I looked at that, <laughs> how in the world am I ever going to afford $500? You right. know, I was broke. I thought 500 bucks, I'll never be able to get enough money for one of these anamorphic lenses. And then sure enough, here we are 20 years later, and it's like $12,000 for a broken down Lomo square yeah, front for parts only literally like crumbling to dust because that's all that's left is the ones that are like unless you get a really good barn find they're all falling apart unless they've been yeah. made and restored but thankfully they made a lot of them on the quota system yeah. uh in the soviet union so there's you know a decent number of them floating around somewhere still um but yeah to your point you know so in my career trajectory i'd been a lighting technician and then I watched the way the digital imaging technician, um, who's another sort of minor celebrity in the cinematography world, Joshua Gollish. So he was our DIT on Everybody Hates Chris. So I was working with Joshua Gollish, who's uh, Roger Deakins' DIT now, uh, working with Eric Messerschmidt, and then Mark Doring Powell, as he was our DP on the show. So I'm watching these guys do their work. And, you know, it's a funny show. Chris Rock's in the show from time to time. He's the creator of the show. And it's, um, it's just an incredible experience watching these master crafts people make this comedy TV show. And that's a time when, you know, Josh Gollish was like a tape operator. So he's doing real DIT stuff, not just downloading and then color correcting the downloaded footage. He's like right. whittling knobs out of a Viper film stream camera with a big tether, you know, umbilical cord tethered to his tent. I'm watching these guys. Like, this guy this guy is making a lot of money. He's making a lot more money than I am. And I was getting paid pretty well. And he doesn't know that much more about technology than I do. Cause I was a big computer nerd. I still am. I said, okay, this guy's making a ton of cash and he's closer to the camera than I am. I'm just out here with these HMIs and, you know, lifting these 18 Ks with my buddies onto these crank evader stands and running, running a uh, four eye cable all over the place. This guy's just got this little umbilical cord and he's twiddling knobs and he's making like, in a tent <laughs> in an air conditioned tent mind you yeah this guy's got the right idea so i watched that and i took the note mentally okay i'm gonna when i have the chance i'm gonna figure out more about being a dit so i i studied all the stuff i could about dit stuff and then i said you know what i'm gonna try this so i started doing dit work on commercials and this is around the time the red one was taking off and um nobody Your nightmare began <laughs> <laughs> For a lot of people, I mean, for a lot of people, that's a career builder, you know, I mean, like the, like the old joke website said, um, I'm a DP because my mommy bought me a red. I mean, I'm glad that they did because that opened a whole Pandora's box for me to make a boatload of cash. Uh, cause to me, that camera was easy. I'm a computer nerd. So the thing's just a computer that's crashing from time to time, but mainly it didn't crash. It was mainly because they had that stupid Sony V mount. Sorry, all V mount users. I'm an Anton Bauer gold mount user. Because those things, the pins on the V mount always come loose and the camera shuts off and they go, oh. um, camera overheated. 
the, those cameras barely overheated, but they all had faulty pins on the V mount on the Sony V mount batteries. That's good to know. Cause I always thought it was an overheating thing, but I, I wasn't, uh, I was still in college when the red one came out. So they gave us DVXs and I owned an XL two. It just, that's a great camera. Love the XL. Still have it. Awesome camera. The form factor is like beautiful. It's the best. Steven Soderbergh likes that camera. I still remember the magazine. Uh, there's like a magazine ad that had him and like the GL2 and the XL2 uh, on the back of it with director's chair. This is Steven Soderbergh. Oh. That's cool. But yeah, it looks like a film mag the way they've got the whole tape drive on the back. It, um, you'll you'll appreciate this. I uh, just recently as a test, I was able to use the S video into an HDMI converter into my Odyssey. So I was able to go tapeless with the XL2 and it was like it wasn't upscaling but it was up resing it to 1080 so with i was like doing a lot of lighting tests with that and i was like you know what it's not as bad as you would think no i remember the dynamic range of those cameras being pretty good all all the analog cameras have great dynamic range actually compared to the early digital stuff yeah so it's crazy um so yeah like that that allowed me to get closer to cinematographers in a technical sense um, instead of being lighting, which was invaluable. I mean, that still resonates to me today. I mean, I lit this little setup. It's not much, but uh, we both look okay for, you know, great. he looks like he's 79 years old if we didn't have this lighting. So. That's sadly accurate. <laughs> yeah, it is fun. I, I will say I've had fun lighting this little, if you saw the setup, you'd laugh at me, but it's a little overkill, but you're on anamorphic. So <laughs> same, same, same. Um, so what went into the sort of, uh, I'm going to jump around the timeline with this reference. Yeah. But I was the one that jumped around. I went way off topic there. Oh no. To, I mean, if, if you've heard this podcast, you know, I'm the king of off fucking topic. Um, but, uh, you just, when did you announce the C, the silver edition lenses? So we announced those, uh, May 4th, Star Wars so, day, May the 4th. So I'm pretty sure I recorded the episode with Jay before that. Nice. Or or it was right after. I'd have to check. It might it might have been right after, but um, otherwise I would have. If that was recent, that's the 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 conceit about Lens Month was it was recorded f- like three four months ago, and then I got a, a rip of uh, interviews right after that that I had to get out. But um, so I learned we learned a little bit more about those lenses, but the original lenses, what was kind of the uh, design ethos and then how did you and sort of the inspirations for those lenses? And then also, how did you end up building them? Because that's been the fascinating thing for me is like, I'm, I don't know how the fuck to design a lens, but smart people do. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So that's I, I did have a very roundabout way of getting to that point, which was um, so lighting, DIT, started shooting. I started shooting on DSLR cameras before that was a popular thing to do. So I shot the first feature on a 5D Mark II, the first feature film on a 7D, and these are like terrible indie movies. And then I've always been a futurist. So I was going like, okay, we're making these little commercials and these short films in New York, because I lived in New York at the time. And we're always out on the street. I'm shooting for a, a cosmetics brand called Makeup Forever. We're, we're always doing these on the street things. And the director always wants to see what I'm filming. And like, this is when the small HD monitor was brand new. So I've got a small HD monitor, which is cutting edge at the time, like the first one. And um, they're always over my shoulder operating me like I'm a camera. And I'm, I'm holding the camera and they're grabbing my shoulders and panning me. And I'm like, there's got to be a better way. There has to be a way to do remote monitoring so that I could give the director a monitor and they could see what we're doing in HD and I'm untethered. I can wander around and be free from their handsiness. And it turns out that other than analog links, there wasn't any good HD video transmitter. So I started thinking like, there's gotta be an HD video transmitter to go with this small HD monitor. And I did some more research because that's research is the cornerstone of everything that I do in my life, whether it's, you know, taking care of my children, um, starting a business or doing cinematography research just pours into it because the world is vast. And the more research you do, the more little tricks you can pick up and try to apply to whatever you're doing. So I'm researching and there's no 
affordable but professional grade HD video transmitter system. Everything's well over $5,000, which was more than my camera cost. So I saw a thing that would let you send a PlayStation uh, HDMI to a TV on the other side of the room. And I thought, this is 150 bucks. This is it. This is the thing. So I, I'm like, okay, I'm going to buy this and then take it apart and then make it my own product, right? So I buy it. I make PTAP cables and uh, Velcro it onto the camera body and it works. And I'm like, God, this is great. A lot of people are going to like this. So I go to the company that makes it and I say, hey, I have a business idea. Why don't we make this for my industry? Because there's a lot of people that will want this. We all need an HD link. And it's some Israeli guys. And they're like, ah, uh, kid, I don't know. You, you know, we don't really care about the film industry. I said, no, trust me, we need this in the film industry. This is what I need as a user. So I know other people need the same thing. How many do you think you could sell a year, kid? I go, listen, this is going to blow you away. I could sell 2,000 of these a year. <laughs> and they laughed in my face. Kid, we are trying to make this something that goes in every TV. We're going to sell 2.5 million of these next month. I go, well, yeah, but for 150 bucks, I go, we could sell these for at least 1,000 bucks each. That's a deal for what we need them to do. Yeah, I don't know. Listen, I'm persistent. So I kept bothering uh, these Israeli guys. Their, their company name was Amimon. They've since been acquired by the Vitek group. So Of course. I to, <laughs> Vitek owns everything as, now. As was my company acquired by Vitek group. That, that's part of the story too. So I go, okay, you guys, you don't want to deal with me. I'm going to figure out another way to get this product made. So I look at who's making the boards that are in the thing. And I find out, okay, there's some guys in China making these boards. I've never been to China. I don't know how to do international business, but I'm a great writer. I'm very persistent and I'm someone who will follow through. You can count on me. I won't give up. So I contact these guys in China. I say, uh, I want to make an HD video transmitter just like these ones, but for my industry. You go, okay, how many do you want? Go, so I could afford a hundred to start. You go, okay, we'll start next month. Send us the money here. We'll start doing it. I say, okay, you're my, you're my people. That's how I roll. You know, we're going to start. You say we're going to do it. I'm, I'm going to do it. We're going to do it. So made a great business deal with some people in China. Fly over there. Basically kickstart the product. We showed it Cine Gear 2012 uh, right here on the Paramount Backlot. And people went bananas for the product. It was called Paralinks Arrow. Um, and I was working with my friend Greg Smokler at the time. So Greg and I put together this you know, tiny business from our garage and managed to turn it into a success. And this is before Teradek was really successful. They had their cube right. product and the promise of cube was brilliant. Like who doesn't want to be able to connect a box to their camera. And then there's this little monitor called an iPad that we can all get. But the biggest problem was at the time processing power on an iPad was not capable of handling a re handling a real time video signal. It was an iPod with a big screen. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So they were, like me, futurists. They were ahead of their time. And the device, the world wasn't ready for a device of that nature. But sure enough, this zero delay, zero latency, Amimon-based product um, was exactly what we needed. Because for focus pullers or operators or directors, we need something that is synchronized to sound in less than two milliseconds delay. And... I took a business with Greg Smokler and Tim Mululi. We put this business together and within three years of starting it in our garage, um, made a company that was selling, outselling Teradek for a while. And the people of iTech Group and Teradek took notice and said, you know, we can't have these ice cream eating kids <laughs> take our market share and show us up because they're industry insiders and we're from General Electric and you know, the film industry doesn't take kindly to, uh, in, you know, stuffy quote unquote corporate engineers, not my words, the words of others. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said, these guys are scrappy, but damn it. The industry likes these guys. And our product was kicking ass. You know, we had the arrow, which was the affordable one. And then we came out with a higher end one called a Tomahawk. And I love, I love that. I remember product. the Tomahawk, you know, Tomahawk, we're going to come in. It's like a missile. 
we just totally took the whole market share and um it felt great because we were making something that people needed and that just made me feel incredible like totally. being able to serve the needs that people like myself uh, with a product that everyone in our industry needs and watch people's face light up like that's exactly what i've been waiting for and so i got the bug of entrepreneurship from starting this company and running it and um sold the company to Vitech Group in like the end of 2014, basically. And uh, after selling the company, I was like, wow, you know, this is a big moment in my life. Like, what do I want to do? And I thought like some people have a midlife crisis at this point and they go and buy a Porsche or they buy a Ferrari. And I was like, I know exactly what I want. Anamorphic lenses. So I go look, okay, I got some money now. What's out there? And then I look at the products that are in the market for, for lenses and I'm like, wow, these are so dissatisfactory. Like, yeah, I could spend like 250 grand and get a set of cook anamorphics that don't do at all what I want them to do. No offense, cook users, or I could get these destroyed Lomo anamorphics that are like awesome. The image quality is awesome, but then I'm going to spend another hundred grand, like renovating them. You know, right. you spend, if you're lucky, you can get a set for 60 grand that are beat and then you need to rejuvenate them. And then who knows how long they'll last. So, wow. I wonder if I could, you know, I remember back, back what I was doing in the early 2000s, DIYing stuff. And I thought, wow, what if I could build a lens? I mean, I just built a company from the garage, knowing nothing about what I'm doing. And I, I figured it out really quick. Wow, it'd be really cool to do something similar, but like a new lens brand. Because then it's not just carrying the image, it's like ingrained in the image. It's part of the image. So it's, you know, a little slice of immortality, if you will. Like it's like right. a feeling you were talking about, like if we could leave a little bit of feeling in every frame or in every work that we do. Wow, okay. I need to put together a team of people. And so I started looking online, doing again, research. And um, that's when I met my co-founder Forrest. So he was doing DIY stuff much in the way I had been uh, 12, 13, 14, 15 years earlier. And I saw the little demo films he was putting out with lenses that he would make in his garage by grafting different projector lenses together. And he even started, um, you know, he's a fabricator. So he's, a brilliant artist and combining that with an engineering background too. He's a sculptor. So he figured out how to sculpt resin. So he's like 3D printing these um, molds and then pouring resin into it, optical resin. And then he's polishing the resin to make the right radii and thickness for the glass on his front porch. And I'm like, wow, this guy may not be able to do it right away, but the spirit of what he's doing and the feel and the go to get it attitude is exactly who I want on my team. I want to be working with someone like that. Who's not afraid to do something crazy and risky and, you know, a little bit messy, get, get dirty, get messy and dangerous, a little bit dangerous. Even uh, this guy's cut from the same cloth. We could start a company and make lenses. So I reached out to him and we started working together to put together like the product definition for what the Orion series would be. And first we were talking about like, well, what if we made an adapter that, you know, everybody could have this adapter sort of like an Iskarama and it could be for everyone. And I'm like, well, the problem is like, it's going to be a customer service nightmare because we'll make this thing. And then as soon as someone doesn't know how to use it, they're going to be emailing us or calling us going, well, I put it on the way I thought I was supposed to, and now I can't get a picture. And then, and this is this is like a trauma that was still being carried from Paralinks, like tech support. So not only was I the CTO and founder of Paralinks, I was also tech support. So I would be getting, I'd still be getting, I still get calls today, like text messages earlier this week, like, hey, my tomahawk's not working. Or can I, how can I repair like these two transmitters? Like, oh, like. You know, but, you know, I still gladly help because to me, that's like the spirit of what we're doing. It's like carrying that on and continuing it. And I'm glad to see that six, what is it, six years on after I left the company, the product is still working. Maybe yeah. they 
pairing two together, but it still works. And that's, that's what I want to do is make things that last for people and make their jobs and lives better. So it was really cool. And so, yeah, like Forrest and I put together the product definition and said, let's make a product that embodies the classic nature of things like Panavision C-Series or Lomo Anamorphics, but are relatively affordable and will work on any professional film set, bar none, no questions asked. And they have to be easy to fix. Like through my research, one of the things I discovered about Russian product design is that they would design things that you wouldn't even necessarily need tools to fix if you ran into a problem. And that's like one of the big spiritual guides for me is like, yeah, if I'm on set and like, I don't have 75 tools on my belt, I still want to be able to adjust the camera or adjust the part really quickly. Um, and so to me, toolless design for onset ergonomics is absolutely essential. And, um, that was something that guided us in making the Orion series lenses from a mechanical standpoint. These things need to be bulletproof. Uh, they should be easy to work on. So if something goes wrong, if you're not a lens technician, you could learn how to become a lens technician with these lenses if you have the guts. Um, and that's like, you know, just like Daniel was saying, like Daniel started here without prior lens training and prior lens experience, but he's bar none, one of our best technicians now. Um, and he's nothing less than a master lens technician at this point. So to me, it's like a journey. It's a spiritual journey of always becoming something. It's like Atlas will never be done. It's always about transition and growing and changing and learning. And that's something that um, is really important to me for the people here in the company as well, is that it's not just a place that we work and like, oh yeah, like I work there, it's whatever. We come here, we do great work, but we also have fun and we also learn. So my goal is for anyone that works here, even if you're only gonna work here a year or six months, my hope is that anyone who does work here, years later they go and they think like, I can't believe I got to work there. That was an incredible Willy Wonka's chocolate factory experience. It's it's a little bit of insanity, but like magic is happening, you yeah. know, right before our eyes. So, you know, to your point about like what went into the way the lenses feel, we wanted something that would be paying homage to the classic anamorphic lenses like Panavision C series. And in a, in a spiritual succession way, even borrow from the idea of Bosch and Lohm, uh, Baltar cinema scope lenses, uh, which are something that I have a pretty decent sized collection of now. So oh, I, preserved, wow. I preserved some of the CinemaScope Bosch and Lom lenses that were used to make films like Rebel Without a Cause and um, Carousel, The King and I, many other uh, 1950s films. Um, Do you have the zero optic versions or just the originals? So I have Alex doing a set of the spherical ones, but the anamorphic ones, I did talk to him about rehousing the anamorphic ones. And he's like, he's like, yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> it's really about preservation with those anyway yeah so some of them i did manage to put uh pl mounts on and so um if you i don't know if you've heard about media division but um yeah. this is brilliant guy in germany nicholas moldenauer and his insane production value for oh youtube gosh. videos good lord <laughs> it's massive and so um his recent scope chapter two features those very same bosch and loam uh, CinemaScope Baltars in comparison to modern Atlas lenses side by side, uh, shot by great cinematographer and friend uh, John Pears. So he shot a lot of content for Atlas and um, he did a side by side comparison between those 1950s lenses and Orion's. And some of the aspects are and a attributes are sim similar, like the color, uh, the color rendition is really similar. So that was something we wanted to kind of embody and imbue as the way that colors feel, it should feel like film. Um, but all the things that we don't like about those vintage anamorphic lenses like mumps are gone. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, sort of a way of carrying um, a connection between the past and the origins of anamorphic cinematography and being a bridge to the future. And that's, that's really our spiritual guidance here. Did, um, oh, go ahead. 
I was going to say, I think that's what a lot, a lot of the uh, larger companies kind of get wrong too, is they're trying to think, they think quality in terms of like marketing, like how can we, what's a metric we can say that our, our lenses are better than yours in this metric, in this metric. And, you know, if you look at like, like in Japan, they like a lot of the best Japanese companies, they don't even market their quality because they know quality is not something people look for in the marketing. That's something that when they actually open the product and use it, that's when they actually see the quality. That's how they make that judgment. So instead of trying to make the lens that, you know, hits the best, like the, the, the most line pairs or something, we're just trying to make the lens that we know once it's in your hand, that's, it's going to give you a certain feeling that maybe the other lens that hits this metric, this metric, and this metric it is not going to give you. Yeah. I, I actually, that's, that's a nice kind of little segue there. I wanted to ask you specifically, what were some of the things, preconceptions that you had going into being a lens technician and maybe some of the things that surprised you? I honestly, I would say I had no idea what to expect. It was, it was a very wide eyed experience of just being, of just terms being thrown at me. Every there are terms now that are, that are so minor to me that the first time I heard of it, it was like terrifying. So it's like, am I supposed to know what that is? Am I supposed to know what that is? I didn't know what bokeh was when it first came in. And now it's just something I don't even like think about. I think I have like a, probably a better understanding than a lot of the uh, people I hear talking about it. Um, I think one thing that helped me is just the fact that I didn't come in like having a bunch of like preconceived um, sort of like philosophies about lenses. I was able to come in and um, sort of like think about the lenses in a, in a sort of objective way. And I think a lot of other people who will work on our lenses will think of it more subjective. They're thinking in terms of like, what do I like in a lens? Whereas I was able to kind of come in and just, it, it, it's hard to explain it. It's just sort of like this whole new world that I was able to come into with no preconceived like notions, ideas or anything. Um, it's like a tabula rasa, like a clean slate, like no idea, right? That's, that's beautiful. And there's so many, like I, a lot of our, uh, my coworkers who are technicians who came in with a lot of uh, experience just and, and, you know, a lot of knowledge about uh, this world beforehand. We'll all have all these opinion, like strong opinions about uh, you know, everything that they want in the lens. And I have like no strong opinions. I kind of, uh, I think it, it allows me to appreciate all the differences. Like if a lens has a lot of fall off of it, the vignettes, I don't have a lot of like, well, well, I hate that. I hate when it does this. I appreciate if something, you know, has a lot of vignetting, if it has no vignetting, if it falls off really early, if the fall off is, you know, way at the very edges. I appreciate it all, um, which I think is something I probably wouldn't have had if I came in sort of already having formed those opinions. On yeah, it's definitely like the, it's the mind of an artist versus the mind of a scientist, right? A scientist is will, willing to be told you're wrong. Yeah. And I think artists are like, nope, I will listen to, no I got a buddy of mine who's a fantastic painter and he refuses to uh, like read an interview or watch an interview or look at anything, any other artist who's ever done anything, he actively covers his ears because he wants, he wants it all to come from him. Whereas I feel like a scientist is like, you know, come from him, quote unquote, but uh, everyone's inspired by everything. But um, yeah, that, that mind of a scientist, I think is something that uh, I think a, a lot of the younger generation seems to be into uh, when it comes to cinema talk, you got your Gerald Dunn's and your whatnot that a lot of people enjoy that maybe aren't even cinematographers or filmmakers, but also um, I think is a better way to go about it. There's a, you know, Eric Measuresmith is I think another person who's very, seems to be very, um, tries to be objective. I wouldn't know specifically. I had to do a lot of research for an interview that never happened, but <laughs> It kind of ties into what you guys were talking about before too, where a lot of the the stuff you see now, it's it's uh, a lot of like plug and play, like a light there, a light there, let's just get it done. I think those are probably a lot of people that aren't really, you know, maybe it's that they lack the, they're more scientific than, you know, artists. They're thinking, okay, well, we need, you know, this amount of light. I mean, it's all very like metric based, very objective. Whereas the, the artists, I think what makes it so beautiful is very subjective. It's very, I just feel this is what I feel is it's supposed to be. You know, it's like the yeah. difference between like a doer and like a teacher. A teacher just sort of learns the rules and then they can recite them. Whereas a doer, maybe they don't even know the rules. 
but they just sort of kind of have that instinct of what to do. Like there's some great singers that probably can't tell you all these different things about like pitch and, and uh, you know, what a, a certain note sounds like. They just, you know, in their head, they can, they know a great song and they're able to get it out. Whereas there are some people who know every little detail about music, but they can't write a great song or at least the song that little, you know, people will resonate with. Well, it goes back to that feeling versus, uh, you know, objective truth thing because i I've, I've been really um fascinated by this spectrum so to your point uh dave Grohl can't read music yeah never never learned how he just kind of figured that out and uh my buddy who's the painter he used to be a professional motocross rider and so he he's always described even art as you can only think about the next turn the man has uh drive like i've never seen but he's a painter. And, and sometimes I see friends of mine who are artists who I'm like, man, I really wish you had that pro. I used to work for Red Bull, you know, so you, I was just around all these pro athletes and I was like, I learned a lot from them because they're still goofy as hell. But like when it's go time, they're just this focus and um, inability to let things that don't matter get in the way. Um, I think a lot of artists could take on or make a part of their own psyche. Did you see that interview Dave Grohl did with Pharrell recently where he was talking? Yes, I did. That's so funny. The, the Gap Bang stealing. <laughs> All those very famous ribs, he just stole them. But I mean, he's very like good natured and honest about it. But yeah. Well, I, I think I'm a, so I've, I've been a drummer my whole life and Grohl obviously is one of the big ones, but uh, he got me in, not him personally, but like being a fan of his through Queens of the Stone Age got me in, to be a fan of Led Zeppelin. Cause he was saying for the longest time, like, Oh yeah, I just built my drum kit, like Bonham and then just learned to hit the shit out of him, you know? Uh, but I think that's kind of important. Like everyone, the <laughs> great dovetail again, me, um, everyone has, everyone has, you know, things that you kind of steal until you know what you're doing and then you modify for yourself. No one, no one yeah. truly comes out of a vacuum knowing how to, for instance, uh, make a lens. So my next question was going to be, where did you look at the, eh? where did you get those? Um, Cause this is kind of fascinating me. Where did like the actual optical groupings kind of come from? Like, where do you start? Is there like a book that says start with these three and move from there? Or were you actually looking at like the Bosch lenses and kind of like borrowing from here and borrowing from there and stuff or how'd that come about? Yeah. So for forest uh, you know, I was looking to forest, originally to be our optical designer and i at the beginning of this i thought man i'm about to have kids i don't even know if i want to be in this business full time but i'm a great advisor you know i, I built a decent amount of wisdom from the previous business and uh if i get the right team of people together i can just sort of sit from afar and make sure that this runs itself and he is really self-taught when it comes to optics for us. So he had started with an app on his iPhone that you could put optical groupings together in ray trace um, before wow. the ZMAX copy. So he was doing, you know, before I even met him, he was designing relay lenses uh, like you'd use for a um, depth of field adapter. He was doing all kinds of things. He was, you know, polishing resin, like I was saying, and, and trying to make optics on his front porch and, uh, it's amazing to see how far he's come now from when I first met him. I mean, he's, he's truly a master optician at this point, but I thought, you know, it's really important that we not only have like that DIY spirit that I'd embodied uh, so early on, um, but we want someone also to be sort of a Yoda to our Luke Skywalker. Right. And so I had built some connections with a team of people making uh, heads up display glasses. That was one of my other fascinations is FPV goggles for drone flights. So I was heavily, heavily into the drone thing. And I met these guys that were making a, what they call a virtual retinal display. So this thing would use DLP lasers to paint an image on the back of your retina through optics. Like and so, uh, the Google glass or like what they use in um, fighter pilots? Like fighter like pilot helmets. Fighter pilot thing. This definitely comes from defense, and it's it's not even like a heads up display. Like it's in front of your eyes. It's literally using the DLP chip to paint the image on the back of your retina, and uh, it's scary when you think of it. So I'm, yeah. I, 
had contacted these guys and they had definitely come from Department of Defense projects before starting this startup uh, called Avagon. And these, none of the guys at Avagon had ever flown drones before. And I was a heavy drone pilot. And I thought like, you know, drones are the next sort of evolution of what I was doing with Paralinks. So I flew up to San Francisco and I met with the Avagon people and I gave them their first drone experience through their own goggles. So I went to their company barbecue that they were having in a park up there in the Bay Area. And I brought my drone and I brought a Paralynx and we hooked it up to their goggles and I blew their minds because none of them had ever tried it with a drone yet. And so this was an HD, this is in a time when, you know, we look at drones now and it's like, oh yeah, it's an HD link to my phone, no big deal. But right. this was in 2013 and there was no such HD video wirelessly from drones at that time. So we were pioneering that stuff. For context um, for people yeah. listening, this is like GoPro Hero 3 era. <laughs> yes, good point. And like Phantom 1, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, Maybe even Hero well, 2. Yeah, here it was definitely Hero 2 times. Maybe just right when Hero 3 was about to come out. Um, so yeah, that I built a really lifelong friendship with um, Dr. Alan Evans up there and Ed Tang, who is uh, his co-founder. And so, you know, we kept really friendly. And I knew that they had opticians who were designing the DLP systems for their heads up displays. I said, Hey, you know, I'm putting together this lens company to make cinema lenses. Do you happen to know anyone who has any idea about how to make cinema lenses? And they connected us to Scott DeWald, who is our chief optical engineer here at Atlas. And he is someone who is an anamorphic lens specialist as happenstance would happen. <laughs> this is how my life happens, by the way. It's like fortune just falls on me all the time. And I'm always just trying to do the best that I can to just give back and give kindness to everyone. And then just things shower on me like luck. And, um, you know, meeting Scott DeWald is one of those lucky moments because this guy was trained by the masters at ISCO. He was the mm. technical VP at Schneider for years. Um, he's an anamorphic lens genius. And you couldn't find a better match for what we were doing because he loved doing that stuff before he left Schneider and ISCO and no one wanted animal thick lenses. So this is old hat for him from 1996, 1997. And so he'd been at Texas Instruments and then he'd been absorbed into the DLP group at Texas Instruments. And they were using anamorphic lenses because the chips were four by three to do digital cinema. So they would use the ISCO uh, company which Schneider had acquired to make uh, anamorphic projector lenses. So honestly, we couldn't have been more fortunate to come in contact with a true optical master trained by some of the German masters and some of the Japanese optical masters. And anyone who knows Scott, he is beyond an interesting character. He's super cantankerous. He loves to barbecue. And I remember the first time that um, it was like about to be Labor Day and Forrest and I called, you know, Forrest lived in Salt Lake City at the time and I was down here in LA and Forrest had come down to hang out with me and, you know, plan the business and work on stuff. And I'm like, okay, I got this wild guy. This is a great opportunity that's fallen in our laps. Let's make a call then. So we call him together on the phone, Giddy, about how exciting we are, how excited we are about this opportunity. And he goes, hello. <laughs> And we're like, oh, is this a good time to call? He's, I'm barbecuing. Like, maybe this wasn't a good time to call him. But um, love, the, love the man. He's just a character and a half. And the stories he has blow my mind. Uh, his techniques, you know, he's very much a scientist, but nothing short of an artist himself. And his life is art. I mean, he's a fascinating, fascinating person. Um, so between he and Forrest, we managed to design the first three um, Orion series lenses. And we started by prototyping one, the 65 millimeter lens. And we built the business off the prototypes. So it goes back to the story I was saying earlier about show people, don't tell them, don't ask them. Show people and then let them tell you what they want after that. So we built this great plan. We built these three 65 millimeter prototypes and we went to NAB 2017 
uh, by the good graces of the people here at Tiffin. So we're, we're subletting the building we're in now from uh, the Tiffin company here in Burbank. Oh, wow. And they have been nothing but gracious hosts and great collaborators, great friends. And they allowed us to be in their booth at NAB 2017 free of charge, you know, because we're a startup. We don't have money for our own booth. Um, all I had money was for those three prototypes. So we build these prototypes, you know, we ha haven't had a lick of sleep. We go to the show and we're in the booth and um, we've been operating in stealth completely. And we dropped the prototypes at the show and we're getting them in every booth we can. So one day we've got them in the DJI booth because I've got friends at DJI. Another day we've got them in the free fly booth. Another day we have them over at Red. So we're just taking the lenses around. Thanks to my friend, Nara Lavoni, who used to be my bomb squad rep at Red when I was a Red customer. Um, he joined our team to help with the trade show and Andrew Dugan, uh, his good friend from college. So we got out there like a street team and, you know, again, borrowing from that whole skateboard mentality of just get it done, whatever it takes, DIY. Um, you know, I grew up a punk rock kid and a skater and we just, would make DIY flyers for shows. We do whatever it takes to make the show happen. And that's exactly how we approached this NAB show. And people went bananas because what we were doing really resonated with the feeling of what people wanted for an anamorphic cinematography lens for a price that's comparable to a great spherical lens. So it was, yeah. it was, Ever since that moment, it's been nonstop <laughs> gangbusters. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was definitely like, uh, I think you also kind of kicked off something, which was affordable anamorphic was like we were saying, like hodgepodging uh, projector lenses together, stuff like that, which harkens back. We've talked about this a couple of times on this podcast, but the the old days of the um, the 35 millimeter adapter being put on the front of a DVX or whatever, and just adding two extra feet of nonsense to the front of your lens and losing about four stops of exposure. Um, and then you guys come out and make an, an affordable lens. And now you've got these other companies, you know, Vazen, I get, or who are the Sirui and all these companies that are starting to make these uh, micro four thirds mount anamorphics that are um, expensive. And I, I would say that probably you guys had a, a, uh, kickoff moment for a lot of people going like because it seems silly but yes of course we want affordable anamorphics <laughs> and now there's there's a uh i guess you have to be the first person to prove that people want it for all the bigger companies to go oh i guess we should invest it's the second order consequence that you know what you're talking about is something that we had predicted would be something that would happen eventually and it was just a matter of time so um, not to give too much away about what we have up our sleeve, but we always want to be one step ahead. That's good to hear. Uh, we're kind of coming up on time, but I real quickly just kind of wanted, since it just did sort of happen, talk to me about the, uh, the silver series, uh, of lenses and, um, kind of what, if anyone's seen it, Jay Holbin and, uh, Katie Williams did a, um, uh, sort of a short with them and they kind of, they do have a more. Uh, not old school because that's the wrong term, but like, I know you in, in the second classic. Yeah, classic. Yeah, because like I remember in the thing it says like, oh, this is supposed to harken back to sort of the fifties, but it did remind me of maybe it was just because they shot a sci-fi thing, but it does have that sort of Terminator kind of. Um, I just watched Demolition Man, like that kind of look. That it's a little more modern than sort of vintage, if that makes any sense. I'm using yeah. heavy air quotes for people listening. Definitely with um, Katie and Jay's piece where they're on the spaceship, you know, so much of it depends on the art direction and totally. what front of the screen and the lighting, but um, it's sort of a way of being just what you need it to be, right? It'll, it'll, the lenses will transform and be adaptive to what you put in front of them. So to that point, um, you know, we're actually looking at ourselves through an Orion series silver edition lens now. And so the mission, you know, the mission with the original Orion series was make anamorphic lenses that people can afford that harken to the 1970s and 1980s um, films that we grew up on, whether it's Poltergeist or Indiana Jones or uh, any of the Star Wars films. 
um, or whether it's Punch Drunk Love from 2002. Um, and they're very expressive, the flares with the silver edition. So the concept of the silver edition lenses is to take the nuances of the Orion series and then invert them and make them more like silver screen era film making tools. So if you look at the flares that come from the Bosch and Lone Cinemascope lenses, the anamorphic elements are uncoded because they just didn't have quite the coding technology that they do now. And so those uncoded surfaces would give you a really neutral flare characteristic um, because it's just white light bouncing around. You know, whatever color light source you're putting into it will bounce off the internal surfaces and create those reflections. And so we wanted to embody that. Um, we also optimize the air spacing between the elements to give you a richer focus fall off. So it's not to make it shallower depth of field, but actually carry focus uh, through the point of focus, 75% behind the point of focus and 25% before the point of focus. And the regular Orion series or the OGs as we like to call them, they have a 50-50 split um, on your through focus. And through focus is not something that a lot of people talk about because it's one of those technical considerations, but um, artists often talk about the way Leica lenses have a 3D pop or 3D characteristic. And really the technical attribute that they're referencing is the concept of through focus, which is quality of focus in a three-dimensional space, not just in a XY plane in terms of field, like here to here, or sorry, Daniel, here, <laughs> here. but uh, through focus is your Z dimension of focus. Mm -hmm. And so there's different attributes that make that up. Um, field curvature, which is sort of a dish shape or a parabolic shape to the focus field. Um, and then the way that the, fo the focus actually falls off in space in a given point is through focus. Um, so that was a long-winded way of talking about that through focus thing, but. Um, well, I appreciate it. Cause I, A, didn't know that existed, but B, uh, oh, see, that's nice. You're gonna have to, anyone listening, you're gonna have to watch the video to see what he's doing. But yeah, that's a very nice, uh, uh, neutral, long flare off of a cell phone uh, light. Yeah, so there, these silver edition lenses aren't uncoated. We developed our own, what we call silver coating. And the silver coating exacerbates flare uh, in some parts of the spectrum and transmits more light in other parts of the spectrum. So it's a specially notched uh, coating design that we put on the cylinder optics themselves. Gotcha. And that's really with that neutral flare characteristic that um, changes. So if we had a red, I wish I brought a red flashlight, but if I did, you'd be able to see it at home. Sure. Kind of a uh, high balance scenario here. And, you know, I have this 6,500 Kelvin uh, flashlight as you were referring to earlier there. Yeah. And these are like much more flary than the, uh, the OGs. The OGs are a little more um, pastel-y, I guess. I don't know how you describe it. Like kind of softer. It's a cyan, you know, cyan blue flare. And some people love that. Some people hate that. I mean, I just revisited Punch Drunk Love. If you go on the Criterion Collection uh, Instagram, you can see some frame grabs from Punch Drunk Love and uh, rest in peace, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Um, the One flare of the actors of in that film is not that different from the Orion series. So we really embrace that, that classic C-series vibe uh, in terms of the coating and flare characteristics of those lenses. And, the silver edition harken more to that Bosch and Lohm era, um, but they have a vibe all their own. You know, they can become very science fiction if you want them to. Um, they're really expressive. So they're meant to kind of sing in the hands of the artist. Yeah. But I did want to go back and say thank you for explaining the through focus thing, because oh. I, I had no idea that you could tune. I, I guess I just assumed that all depth of field was middle. I didn't, I guess it didn't occur to me that you could tune um, how much forward or backward the given point could be uh, in focus or falling off. That is fucking fascinating. It's wild. And, you know, I was recently talking with um, Michael Braven at Canon, and he was talking with Dave Stump, ASC, um, about their Sumi Ray lenses, which, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of lenses. So I'm not just Atlas guy. I'm lens guy. I'm obsessed with lenses. It's, my fascination, my passion, my mania. Um, 
so he, you know, he and Dave Stump had been talking about the way the Sumi rays fall off because they have their own unique through focus characteristic. And uh, apparently those are really great for working with uh, virtual production with LED backdrop because they'll really make those uh, pixels dissolve and become completely imperceptible in the out of focus area. And I would say the, you know, Orion's is anamorphic lenses in general tend to have more of that characteristic naturally, um, but even more so with the silver edition. Yeah. On the, uh, I don't know if you know this, but on just to pick an example that everyone knows the, the Mandalorian, are they shooting Panavision lenses? Are they shooting yeah. Ari? They're shooting Panavision. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Beautiful show. I mean, if you can get, um, Greg Frazier, ASC, or the other the oh. other photographer, that would be that'd awesome. be the dream. I trust, like, well, and kind of not to pick on it, but I, I remember when when Mank was nominated for the Oscar, Netflix was like, Do, "Would you like to talk to him?" And I was like, "Low key." When I started this podcast, I said if I could get someone like Eric Messerschmidt on the show, that I would have peaked. So I'm expecting that phone call like three years down the line, and it came like four months down the line. And it just never happened because the second he he was on um, uh, whatever the the war sh- movie he was on, and then he immediately went and started a new movie. So he just never had the time to do it. So, <laughs> but Greg would be amazing. I was surprised I got uh, uh, pro or um, not Probst, uh, um, Holbin, Jay Holbin. Yeah, I've been really blessed with guests. I'm not gonna lie, he's an incredible writer. He's oh, such a great wordsmith. And the fact that he's not only a great wordsmith, but knowledgeable about our craft visually. Um, and Katie's tremendous cinematographer. Yeah. Just, just great. You should get Chris Probst on here. I he's, should get Probst. I should get Katie. There's yeah. a lot of, if anyone's listening, please come on my show so I can talk. To, <laughs> that's all I want to do is talk to people about this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, we are, I mean, I, 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 I say this to pretty much everyone. I could talk to you guys for like two hours, but I know you have jobs and, I just said this with the last podcast. I, I, I would do a three hour podcast, but I think people would get sick of me at some point. So, uh, let them we'll leave it. that they want it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you yeah, would, would like that, fun. that'd be perfect. Um, thanks you guys so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Such a pleasure, Kenny. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. See you. Take care guys. Cheers. Frame and reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. Our theme song is written and performed by Mark Pelly, and the FNR Mapbox logo was designed by Nate Truax of Truax Branding Company. You can read or watch the podcast you've just heard by going to ProVideoCoalition.com or YouTube.com slash Owlbot, respectively. And as always, thanks for listening.